Welcome again. I'm Steve Mondernock. I'm Executive Director of the Association of Food and Drug Officials, and we're very pleased to have partnered on this series of four webinars with our colleagues at uh, AIB International. Um, we're pleased to welcome today uh, Judy Lazaro, who is the Senior Director of Food Safety and Global Sales for AIB today. Judy uh, joined AIB in 1990 and has held various roles, including food safety inspector and head of the audit services for North America. She is now the senior category director for food safety and global sales. After graduating from the University of Houston, Judy served in the U.S. Army as a commissioned officer and then joined the fast-paced food industry with Frito-Lay. She is passionate about the food industry and food safety and offering solutions to complicated issues. Well, we want to begin and move right over to Judy's presentation. If you do have questions or uh, during the presentation, uh, please go ahead and hit, uh, enter them in the Q&A box, and we will definitely have time uh, to get to those questions uh, as we move through the presentation. So thank you again, and welcome, Judy. Thank you so much, Stephen, and a special thanks to, to Amy for coordinating this whole thing and the whole AFTO team. I'm so grateful for, for the opportunity. Think of this, where else do you all want to spend your Friday afternoon but on a webinar, right? Well, I do my best to keep this fast paced, we'll keep it moving, we'll keep it lively, but we also need to keep it interactive. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, it's going to be a long web session if all you do is just watch the screen. So what I encourage you to do is ask questions, type your questions into the question box, ask questions, and we'll do our very best at the end to answer as many questions as we can. You see, that inspector that comes to visit you doesn't have to find the rat running around the warehouse. He only has to find the rodent droppings because that may be an indication that you have a rat running around your facility. So do you understand? It's the may clause. So when you're doing your everyday, you're receiving a trailer or you're stocking, you know, product, putting product away, or you're on the pick line or you're doing something in the warehouse and you have a question like, huh, I wonder if that's a food safety issue. Just remember that word may and ask it as a question and say, may that be a food safety issue? May the product be compromised by what I'm doing? And if you say, yeah, it probably is, then you know what? You have a food safety issue, okay? Now, how do we define that word may? How do we really explain what that word may really means? Here's the neat thing, the government does it for us. So we publish, the government publishes and the food industry publishes, anybody involved in food safety, what's published is this rule, part 117 it's called, and it's called the current good manufacturing practice, the GMPs. You know, why don't you eat and smoke cigarettes while you're in your warehouse? Because it's a GMP. You hear it all the time. But a lot of people say, wait a minute, Judy, the word is manufacturing. It doesn't apply to me. That's, that's for the manufacturers. We're a distribution center. I want you to look closely down that list, go all the way down to 117.93, and guess what it says? Warehousing distribution. You see, the good manufacturing practices give you your very own section because food safety absolutely does apply to you. Now, AIB International comes along and we're not regulators. We don't carry a badge, okay? We don't have authority to come in and, and shut your facility down if you're doing something wrong. But what we do is we take the good manufacturing practices and we further define it. So we even further explain the May Clause. So the GMPs, for example, say, you know, you shouldn't have pests in your facility. We take a whole section and say, here's how to keep pests out of your facility, okay? These are available for free. You don't have to pay a penny. You can reach me at the end of this session. I'll put it right in your mailbox or you can download it for absolutely no cost at all right off of our website, okay? So please take advantage. It's an absolute free download. It's the answer to the test and distribution centers have their very own standard, okay? So it's quite specific to distribution. You don't have to read through it and think, I wonder if that applies to me. I wonder if that applies to me. I wonder if that applies to me. You have your very own standard. So that's one thing I want you to remember. There's one other thing. I, maybe I fibbed a little bit. So there's maybe two things I want you to remember. The other is the word ice. And it's a simple, simple root cause analysis. It's how we train our AIB inspectors, in fact. We say, when you go through a facility, you try to identify food safety issues, you try and control the food safety issues, and then you work really hard on eliminating the food safety issue. So here, here's the beauty of the inspector job. 
For us, we really, our job ends with identify and often control, but we don't really have to be the ones to eliminate. That's really your job. Let me give you an example. If I come into your facility and you have, for example, a roof leak, I'm going to identify it. I'm going to say you have a roof leak. And I'm going to suggest, give you some suggestions on how to control it. I'm going to say, you know, maybe you want to move the stock that you have in that area, move it away from the roof leak. Maybe you want to put up a canopy or a tarp so the, the water doesn't contact any of the product below. Do you understand what I've done? I've identified the problem and now I'm controlling it. But then guess what happens to me? I leave your facility. You see, you're left with the E part and the E part is really the hardest part. See, the easiest part, and it's kind of my little secret as an inspector, the easiest part is identifying. And then it takes a little more effort to control, but the real work comes with the E and that's eliminating. And that's your job. And that's a big job. So I share that with you because don't assume that everybody in, the, in your distribution company knows as much as you know about food safety. That's why it's important that you do the identify, you do the control, and you also do the eliminate. It's root cause analysis, okay? So now let's take a look at what are the, what's the industry seeing? What are the top misses, if you will? What, what, are the, what are the things that the regulators are finding? What are the things that AIB inspectors are finding? I mean, what are the big issues in the distribution center? Well, let's start with the first one, pest prevention. It means as a whole, we really, in, the, in this space, in this distribution space, we don't do a very good job of keeping the facility tightly sealed or pest proofed. Think of it in terms of pest proofing. You know, if you think, if, if think about the coins that you have in your pocket and pick out a coin that's about a quarter inch in size. Maybe you say, well, it's about the dime. Maybe, maybe it's a dime that you say that's about a quarter of an inch. That's all a rodent needs to enter a facility. That's it, quarter inch opening. So you have to make sure that your doors are closed all the time you're not using them. You need to make sure those levelers, you know, you have the dock leveler pits and you have seals around those dock leveler pits. You need to make sure those plates are, are tight fitting and make sure they're well sealed so pests can't enter into the facility com, uh, coming in through the dock pit, All right? You also have to make sure the human element is in play here. You got to make sure people in this picture here, maybe I close the door and it just is broken. It doesn't close all the way because it's broken. So I need to write a work order. I've identified it, door's not uh, closing. I'm gonna control it. I'm gonna get a work order written so it tightly seals. But how are you gonna eliminate it from ever happening again, right? Identify, control, eliminate. But this one's a little bit different because this is what we call operator error. So here you can see an employee is leaving the door open and they even took a mousetrap that was nearby and they're using it to prop that door. So now you say, I can identify the issue, the door's propped open. I can control it by just putting the mousetrap back. But are you really eliminating anything? Because guess what? If, you, if that's all you do, when you come back tomorrow, I guarantee it's going to be just like that again. And that's why that E, that eliminate part, is really the tough part. And that's the part that all your facilities need to work on. And you know how I know that? Because pest prevention has been one of the top misses for the last five years on AIB inspectors inspections. So that means we're not really doing a great job of root cause analysis. We're doing a great job of identifying it. We're doing a great job of controlling it, but we're not eliminating, eliminating it totally. Because if we were eliminating this as a problem, it wouldn't continue to show up as one of the top misses. And don't limit the openings to just doors in, in, in ground level. Here's a pipe, for example, and you all know when you have like a 12 inch pipe, you have to cut like a 14 inch opening to get the pipe through, but you got to always make sure that you're sealing that opening because may a pest enter through here? May a bird enter through this opening? Yep. May insects enter through this opening? Absolutely. And guess what? May a rodent enter through this opening? Absolutely. So you want to make sure that your facility is tightly sealed. Here's a beautiful warehouse. And I want you all to look at it and say, yep, that's a good looking warehouse. But now you're already looking at this picture with a food safety inspector's eye because of what we just talked about. So you're looking at this beautiful warehouse, but you're also inspecting it by now because we're, we're in that inspection mode. So I know you're inspecting. And what are you all noticing when you're looking at this warehouse? Everybody sees the doors. We have one door that's not even close to being closed. We have others where the daylight's coming through. That's how I want you to go into your facility every day. 
You don't have to add more duties to your already very busy day. You, you're already working full time in your distribution center. So what I don't, I don't want you to work hard. I want you to work smarter. And that's go out there every day and look around and have your food safety hat on and say, you know what, I need to do a better job keeping those doors closed. Because if you can keep that door closed, you will greatly reduce your pest population in your facility. So one thing complements the other, which complements the other and so on and so forth. It also helps with cleaning because you get a lot of dirt and debris that blows in underneath, uh, underneath these doors. So by doing some practices correctly, you're, you're truly it impacts a lot of other programs programs. Okay. Next issue that we still see on inspections, ceilings and overheads. Well, I already gave you the answer to one of them, roof leaks. We do find a lot of roof leaks. And most facilities do a great job of controlling them by putting up what you see in the picture, tarps. And I learned something new just a few years ago. If you go to order these out of like one of your catalogs where you can, you know, purchase equipment and parts and things like that, there's actually a name for these. They're called roof diapers. So things that you learn. See that? Things that you learn on a web session on a Friday afternoon. But they're tarps. I call them tarps. And, um, and again, you can purchase these, but before you go out and invest in buying a tarp, ask yourself, have I worked on the E? Have I worked to eliminate the problem? Have I contacted a roofer? Do I have a capital request in for roof repairs? Have I, do I even have work orders written for these roof repairs? Oftentimes we do the identify and the control when it comes to roof leaks and we really forget about the eliminate. And how you can answer that question in your own facility where you can say, am I really fixing things or am I going through the motion? Ask yourself this question. Do you have any roof leaks in your facility now? If you say yes, then ask the second question. How long have I had the roof leak? If you say forever, you know what? You're not fixing the E. If you say, listen, it just started last week. I wrote a work order for it. I got a, a roofer coming in next Tuesday to look at it. You know what? You're doing everything you should be doing. Okay. Here's another example of a roof, uh, a canopy that's been up for so long that it's the canopy itself is dirty. Okay, so what they've done is they've had a roof leak, they put a canopy up, and now pretty soon they're going to have to add the canopy to their cleaning schedule, which tells you it's no longer a temporary fix. Here's another area, though, and I'm sorry the picture's not as crystal clear as I had hoped, but I hope you can understand what it is. We are in a freezer. We just walked into the freezer. And you can see all of the ice and the snow, all the condensation that's now frozen in the freezer. This is not okay. So remember, all of this snow, all of this moisture is going to land on these cardboard boxes of product or these pails of product. And as soon as you get them outside in the ambient, te uh, ambient temperature, you now have a wet soiled carton of a food product. So it's not okay that you have conditions like this in your freezer. Something is wrong. So don't dismiss it. Don't just think, oh, it's normal. Think about it. Even your freezer at home, and your, if you have a refrigerator, a refrigerator at home and you open up that freezer, you would never be okay with it having all of this ice build up. You wouldn't be okay with it. Don't be okay with it at work either. Something is wrong in the process. Get it fixed. And then peeling paint. So you're thinking, why is it such a big deal? Why can't I have loose flaky paint all over the warehouse ceiling? Because the warehouse ceiling, all that loose flaky paint falls on the product that's stored below, which you end up shipping to a customer, which ends up in a hospital somewhere or a school somewhere or a resident or a restaurant. And that's why there's a place for paint and it's wherever you put it. It shouldn't be coming down, you know, because of the way you're cleaning or because of high moisture or because you applied it incorrectly. If you're going to paint an area, you have to make sure the paint stays where you painted, okay? How about non-product zone cleaning? And what this means is this is the cleaning that takes place that's other than the product itself. So you're doing a nice job of keeping the product clean because it doesn't sit in the warehouse very long, right? It rotates pretty quickly. So it doesn't really have a lot of time to sit around and get dirty and soiled. But how about the other areas of the warehouse? Like, for example, this delivery vehicle. So make sure that you have forklifts, anything that travels around your facility, scissor lifts, forklifts. Make sure they're on your master cleaning schedule. And let's take a second to just talk about a master cleaning schedule. So a master cleaning schedule is a cleaning schedule that you keep for other than daily cleaning tasks. So let me say it again. If it's not, if it's not something you're going to clean every single day, it should be on a master cleaning schedule. 
So for example, I'm not going to clean this forklift every single day, but maybe once a week, I'm going to do a good job of checking it, making sure there's nothing, you know, you know, the seat looks clean underneath the seat. There's no debris left. Maybe I'm going to do that every two weeks, whatever the frequency is. Okay. That's what you put on a, a master cleaning schedule. How about those ceiling fans that you have those large fans in your ceiling? You don't clean those every day, but you know what? You do have to clean them because if you don't pretty soon, all the dirt that accumulates, you start blowing it or tossing it around your distribution center. So you put it on a master cleaning schedule for cleaning once a month, once every six months, once a year. And people will often say, you know, Judy, how do I know what that frequency is? One, ask. There's always reference available. Ask me, ask AIB International. We'll give you some typical, what you know, common cleaning schedules for a distribution center. We'll provide those to you at no cost at all. Um, but ask. The other thing is make sure your cleaning schedule is proactive. And what I mean by that is if you say, well, it gets clean, it gets dirty. It gets really, really dirty every six months. So I'll clean it every six months. Eh. That's reactive. You don't want to do that. You say instead, it gets dirty every six months. Therefore, I'll clean it every five months. Do you understand? You always want to be proactive on your cleaning. So start with some of these non-product zone cleaning areas like this. Start with your forklifts. The other area that you don't want to ignore are, is your outside trash can, your outside trash dumpster. And I put this here because this is one of the other most overlooked sections of your distribution center. So let me back up by saying this. If you knew that you had an inspector in the lobby right now, they're, they're going to inspect your warehouse right now. What do you do? You grab a broom. And you remember that picture I showed you real early, that beautiful warehouse where the doors were open? What you do is you grab a broom and you start cleaning, 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 and you sweep and you sweep and you sweep and you sweep. And that's all great. But what I want you to do is pay attention to this presentation because this is the answer to the test. Because what you could have done in that first picture instead of sweep and sweep and sweep and was close the doors. And you know what? You would have done better on your inspection. Same thing here. When you say, I have the whole outside grounds. I know the inspector's going to walk the outside grounds. They always do. And they're going to. They're going to walk the outside of your building because they want to make sure you don't have a bird population. They want to make sure the outside is clean. But guess what? The dirtiest part of the outside of your facility always remains right here. It's the trash where you're handling the trash. So you do want to make sure that this area is clean. You probably want to talk to your trash hauler, the person that takes the trash away, because when they pull this out to dump it, you might want to ask them to, pull, you know, get a shovel out and start cleaning the debris that spills. And if you work, if you have a good relationship with that, that hauler, they'll do that as a service to you. So make sure you're working closely with that trash hauler. But always the dirtiest part of the facility is going to be the outside grounds on the outside. Dirtiest part of the outside is going to be the outside ground area about around the trash dumpster. It's also where you're going to find birds and pests, other pests like flies and like rats. And then inside the facility, you know what? That clean area is always going to be where everybody travels. Because if the president of the company was coming to the warehouse tomorrow, he would walk all the center aisles. He, he or she would go down the aisles, back down the aisles. So the aisles are always going to be nice and clear and nice and clean. The area that needs the attention is what's called the floor wall junction, the area behind, behind the storage racks. So take a walk behind the storage racks and look for conditions like this. A lot of cobwebbing. In fact, you'll notice cobwebs, they tend to get heavier above the doors around the personnel, or sorry, the roll-up doors. They'll tend to be heavy above the roll-up doors. They'll also tend to be heavy at the ceiling wall junction of the facilities. So take the time and don't just do an eye level inspection, start looking up, okay? But then let's not overlook the floors because, you know, your team has been sweeping the floors ever since they found out there's an inspector in the lobby. They've been sweeping, 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 sweeping. And then the inspector comes in and they don't want to be seen sweeping. So they disappear. Right. And they leave this pile on the floor. And as an inspector, when I see a pile like this, I turn into like a kid in a candy store. And I want you to understand why. OK. Because now all of the filth that was in this one warehouse area, maybe they're in the cooler, maybe they're in the dry storage area, but all of the filth in the area, they have now swept it up and put it in a neat little pile. So what you should do is what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk over to that pile and I'm going to inspect it. 
I am truly going to inspect this pile of dirt. And I know you're thinking this lady is crazy, but I'm really not because the answer to what's going on in this warehouse is in that pile of dirt. And here's what I mean. Let's say, for example, I look at this pile and I find mice droppings, mouse droppings, some rodent droppings. Let's say I find a lot of broken glass. I know somewhere in this warehouse you have a rodent and I know somewhere you have broken glass. And if I, it looks like fluorescent light tubes, then I know you have a broken glass light bulb somewhere. May a broken glass light bulb in a food warehouse be, a, be a, an issue? Absolutely. So may a rodent in a food warehouse be an issue? Absolutely. So if you see a pile like this in your facility, it only takes 10 seconds, just take a look at it, bend over and take a look at it. And even better if you have a flashlight, really inspect it and you'll quickly see what's going on in that facility. The other thing that we tend to ignore are floor drains. If you have, especially if you have a wet side of your warehouse, maybe you have produce, for example, do not forget about your floor drains. And I can tell you they're being forgotten on inspections. So please take the time, investigate your own facility, find out if you do have floor drains. And if you do have them, make sure you're putting them on your master cleaning schedule so they're not being forgotten for cleaning. And, and again, you, where we really see these is if you're in a, if you have produce and you, you know, you're in a produce room or a cooler where they do have a floor drain like the one in the picture here, uh, it's not unusual for us to find them very, very heavily full of mold products and oftentimes cockroaches. Which leads us to the next conversation and that is pests. And you find it hard to believe that you would think in 2021 in the food industry that we would still be finding pests in warehouses, in food warehouses. And the sad part is we're not only finding them, it tends to be one of our top five issues that we're finding globally. Let's start with this. This, my friend, is not rodent control in a food distribution center. This is not rodent control. But I put this here, not really just to have some fun with you on a Friday, but this is here for a real reason. So a lot of the pest control companies have been reporting that this is one of the hardest things now to get rid of when they get into a facility. This is not a pet. This is a pest. It does not have a place in, in a food manufacturing or a food distribution center. It does not mean, please hear me, it does not mean this animal has to be euthanized. It just means we have to remove the, the animal from the facility. So the reason why a lot of pest control companies are talking about this is because if we see something in a facility, we want to encourage people to report it. If they see a bird, for example, they report it. If they see something run under a pallet, they typically report it. But if they see a cat, to them, it's a pest and they don't want to report it because it's almost like they don't want it to get in trouble. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've my, in my own career have gone in and found cats in the facility. And then I'd say to them, did you know the cat was in here? And they go, well, yeah, you know, it's like we were hoping you didn't see it kind of thing. Make sure you encourage your employees if they see something like this to report it. The animal does not have to be euthanized. We just have to get it out of the facility. Okay. The other thing that we do want to make sure we also get it out of the facility is what you see on the screen. We don't want them in the facility and it's a rodent. We definitely don't want these in the facility. And that's why we put rodent control devices outside the facility. The reason why I share this picture with you is what you notice in the picture besides the potato chip, what you notice in the picture is those long whiskers. It's got those long whiskers. It's got big ears and he does hear very, very well. He's got big eyes, but he doesn't see very well. What he does do is relies on those long whiskers and that's how he travels around your distribution center. So you have probably heard and all the time that you've been working in the, in the warehouse, you've probably heard keep product away from the wall. In fact, you probably even know the number if I said to you, how many inches should you keep product away from the wall? I bet if I asked you all to type in the answer right now, I bet more than half of you would say 18 inches. We memorize that, right? We memorize it. It's like, but where did it come from? Why, did I, why does it have to be 18 inches? I mean, that becomes less relevant, right? But here's the, here's the, Here's what you need to know. The 18 inch rule is only a guideline. It's actually more than a hundred years old. It was actually written in a military standard, it was never written to, with the intention of it being a food law. It did find its way a long time ago in the AIB consolidated standards where we actually put it in there as a requirement, 18 inches. 
but it's been long removed from the AIB consolidated standards. But we still all have that number burned in our brain. Don't store anything. It has to be at least 18 inches from the wall. Here's the reason why. This rodent is going to travel using those long whiskers along a floor wall junction. So I, you know, I used the example a couple of weeks ago with the team, and I'm going to use the same example with you. If I were to shut all the lights off in the room you're in right now and said, I want you to get out of this building and meet me in the front parking lot, and I shut everything, and it's, it's now as dark as the night, and you have to get out of the building from where you're sitting, how do you do it? put your hand out, right? You put your hand out and you find the wall. And then you follow that wall all the way out of the facility. That's exactly how this rodent's going to travel the facility. That's exactly how he's going to do it. He's going to use his whiskers instead of his hand. He's going to use his whiskers and he's going to follow that floor wall junction. And guess where you have all your rodent control devices? Along the floor wall junction. And that's why you want him to travel the wall junction because that's how you're going to catch him. But now if you take a pallet and you put it right up against the wall, you break that quote unquote 18 inch rule, which remember isn't really, a, it's not, it's not written in stone in the AIB standard. But you know, if you have that pallet right up against the wall, now that rodent has a new path that he's going to travel, a new floor wall junction, and he's going to travel along that pallet now. And now he's five or six feet away from the wall. And he hears a vibration because he hears that really, really well. And he's afraid of not necessarily you and me, he's afraid of a hawk. So what he's going to do is he's going to duck for cover and he's going to go right underneath that pallet. And you know what you have now? Now you have a rodent in your facility that you're probably not going to catch because he's now five or six feet away from where you keep all your rodent control devices. So it's really important that we keep that rule of keeping things away from the wall. It also allows for us to do a great job of inspecting and cleaning. Because again, if everything's up against the wall, how do you clean around those pallets? So keep things away from the wall. Whether you do it 14 inches, 12 inches, 11 inches, 10 inches, that is not the relevant point. The intent is to have clear access to that floor wall junction. What you see on the screen is something that is required on most every inspection that you have, and it's called the pest sighting log. So on an AIB inspection, for example, the inspector will say, show me your pest sighting log. And you open up your, your uh, IPM manual book, your pest control book, and you hand the inspector that and they look at it. That is probably not the best location to have a pest sighting log. So when you're keeping it like that and you're sharing it with an inspector, that means you're only keeping it to satisfy an inspector. And that's not what you want to keep it for. A pest sighting log, who do you think is more likely going to find that cat? Who do you think is more likely going to find a rodent? It's something running around the warehouse. The inspector that comes in once a year, once every couple of months, a customer that comes once every couple of months, you know, uh, maybe your self-inspection team that goes out and does it once a week or once every month, probably you. You are probably the one, the operator that's driving the forklift, the one that's out there 10 hours every day, you are more likely going to see that rodent. You are more likely going to know about the bird that just flew in. You're more likely going to know about the cat that's been sneaking in at night. You're going to know that. So you encourage your employees to fill out a pest sighting log. You encourage them. You make it accessible to them and you say, hey, if you see anything, if you're seeing a lot of flies, if you're seeing fruit flies, if you're seeing something, a lot of cockroaches or one cockroach, if you're seeing something that doesn't look right, tell somebody about it. The best way to tell somebody about it is you write it down. I, I was just sharing with a group earlier uh, this week. I was talking to another group and, and I saw something that I thought was great. And it's a company that takes a pest site and log to a whole new level. Not only do they encourage their employees to fill out a pest sighting log, not only do they encourage it, but they give incentives. So if you complete something on the pest sighting log, they give you a scratch lottery ticket. If you complete it, they give you a company t-shirt or they give you a free lunch coupon for something in the vending machine, something like that. I mean, I thought it was a great incentive, but what they're trying to do is they are encouraging people to do self-inspections every single day. And the more you do that, the less likely you are going to have pests in your facility. We cannot talk about pests without talking about birds. And I, if you've never had a bird in your facility, it, it, I never say if you have one. I say when you have a bird in your facility, because the chances are if you're if you're a distribution center and you have roll up doors, you're probably going to get a bird in your lifetime that's going to come into a facility. One of the common questions we have is how do you get rid of them? 
Okay, it's one of the common questions. And you're really right now you're doing everything right. And that is close a couple of doors. So you have one door that's very light and you keep keep the keep the bird moving keep chasing it around chasing it around and it will instinctly head over to that door if you have one door open it'll see the light and head outside and that's what most of you are doing and that's very very effective there's a lot of other things that i'll be happy to talk about just shoot me an email and we i can talk bird control with you all day long okay and then let's talk about floors because again, this is always one of the top issues that we see on the inspections, the condition of the floors. And I didn't have any great pictures, so I'm just gonna read something with you, but we're gonna close it off with some great pictures. So it says holes, cracks and crevices in floor surfaces are repaired to prevent debris from lodging and to avoid pest or microbial harborage. Floors are designed, constructed and maintained to meet the demands of the facility operation and withstand cleaning materials and methods. You know what that says? It says your floors have to be in good condition. That's really what it says. And that second one, if you have forklifts, for example, that are maybe they're going around a floor drain and every time they drive over that floor drain, they're breaking pieces of the cement. More and more concrete pieces are going, large pieces of concrete. That means you're in violation of the second element on the screen. It's not withstanding the operation. OK, let's say you have floors that have large expansion joints. If it, you know the floor joints, the floor cracks on the floor, they're called expansion joints, the ones that are there on purpose. Let's say you have some of those and you're a facility and you have all canned goods. Everything in your facility is a canned good. You know, it's probably not that critical that you seal those expansion joints and you never want to seal them with a concrete compound. All it'll do is continue to crack. But there are some other ways of sealing them. There's some rubberized sealants out there and there's a whole bunch of them out there. But again, before you start sealing expansion joints, ask yourself, do I need to? Am I going to get debris lodging inside of this? Am I going to have a pest problem? So again, let me give you some scenarios. If I am a pet food company and I have dog biscuits and dog bones and things like that that I'm storing in my warehouse, I probably don't want to have deep floor expansion joints because that grain will accumulate inside of those deep floor expansion joints, which means one of two things has to happen. One, I'm going to have to routinely clean that out or two, I'm going to have to seal it. But now take that other facility that I mentioned, the one that's all canned. Is debris going to enter into those large cracks? Probably not. Probably not. Unless maybe it's going to be some cardboard dust, maybe a little bit of dirt. So I still want to clean out those expansion joints, but I'm not going to be cleaning them out at the same frequency if I were to have pet food, for example. And the reason why is pet food is a grain-based product like flour. Okay, and, and if you have an accumulation of that debris inside of those expansion cracks, you will get stored product pests, you'll get insects. So it's really a struggle when you have floors, you say, do I seal it? Do I not seal it? Before you go and make a huge investment, I always encourage people, talk to us over here at AIB. We'll ask you to send us some pictures. We'll say, you know what, send us a couple of pictures. And then we'll ask you some questions about your facility. We'll say, well, tell me a little bit about your product. We're not being nosy. We're, we don't, we're, we're not trying to understand every inch of your facility, but we want to give you good sound advice. And it's really to seal or not to seal. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us, okay? So those are the top misses. Those are the top things that the food industry is missing when it comes to distribution centers. Now let's close it out with a little bit of fun for you. What's wrong with the picture? And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna give you the first one. What's wrong with the picture? We have all these gum machines and the sign that says absolutely no gum. So you can kind of figure out what's wrong with that picture. But how about this? How about candy wrappers on, si on, on top of some stored product in one of the distribution centers? Is it okay to eat, drink, and smoke in your facility? Mm -mm -mm, absolutely not, because you're violating the May Clause. Okay, you're violating the good manufacturing practices, but remember the May clause. So it's still sad that we're going into facilities and we're finding candy wrappers and we're finding some gum that's spit on the floor. Sometimes we find chewing tobacco that's been spit on the floor. Um, where you typically find these things is uh, not in the front of the aisle, but it's behind the storage racks. So remember, you want to go behind the storage racks to the floor wall junction behind the storage racks because that's where the 
bad behavior generally takes place. It's not right out in the open. It's, it, it, you know, where you find the cigarette butts and things like that is behind the storage racks. How about this picture? We're in a cold storage area. What, what's wrong with this picture? And if you notice, you're looking up at the ceiling and that's, the, that's a refrigeration unit. You're looking up at the ceiling and you see a lot of rust on the ceiling. And that's usually an indication of what? moisture, right? So there's probably a roof leak here, or maybe there's an expansion seal, but there's something wrong. There's an indication of moisture. So don't think just because it's in cold storage, it's not, you're not going to have a roof leak or something similar. So make sure you're doing a great job of looking up. How about a footprint on some products? Hmm. Think about in your career, have you ever stepped on top of maybe those, those canned goods that you were trying to get the, the carton from the second level so you step on the canned good this is a no this is a big no-no in the food industry so although it doesn't show up as one of the top issues it does show up as a common finding so it's not one of the top five but it does show up as a common finding so please discourage your employees from sitting on the pallets from standing on the pallets from sitting on the product standing on the product it's not what you want to do pay attention also to a lot of chemicals so if you find chemicals like this, even if you just find a cleaning compound, but one, make sure the containers are always labeled to content. And you can see that big container in the back is unlabeled. It's sitting there. There's no label on it. Maybe there is on the other side, but let's assume that there's no label on it. Okay. That, that would be a huge issue because, you know, may there be something in there that's going to contaminate the food product? Absolutely. So then you want to look at some of the other chemicals and you, you know, it looks like a glass cleaner and some other kind of cleaner, but one of them on the screen is actually a bug spray, an insecticide. And again, this is not something that shows up as our top five, but sadly shows up in the list of top 10 findings. Employees will take it upon themselves to control the pests that they see in the warehouse. They think they're helping. So, you know, in their garage at home, maybe they had a problem with flying insects. So they bought maybe a fogger or they bought a spray and it worked in their garage. So now that they're in the warehouse, they see the same problem. Maybe they see a lot of fruit flies in the produce cooler and they go, you know what? I'm going to bring in some bug spray from home and, and, and help the company get rid of this. That's a real no-no. And you want to discourage that, really discourage that because, you know, they're not trained to properly use a pesticide. It's one thing to use it at home in your garage. It's another Another thing to use it in an area where there's food that's going to be feeding a population, okay? So make sure that you discourage your employees from bringing any kind of chemical from home. What I would also do in a, if, if I were a supervisor in a warehouse like this, I would probably write down a couple of these chemicals. I'd write down the, the Windex, for example. I'd write down what looks like, I don't know, Simply Green or whatever the cleaner is. And I would make sure that I have it on my chemical control inventory because I know the inspector is going to ask me for that. So I would get a head start on it and I would write it down and then verify that it's on my chemical control list because every warehouse has one. So verify that it's up to date, verify that these chemicals are really supposed to be in the facility. And then we can look at this picture and say, what's wrong with it? And you can see it has a white line painted. They painted a white line kind of as a reminder that, you know, hey, keep things away from the 18 inch, you know, the 18 inch rule that we talked about that, like I said, is a hundred year old rule. Um, but you can see they have product that's encroaching on the wall. It's not directly touching it, but it's starting to get close. So it's something you want to say, eh, probably want to move that pallet away from the wall. How about this? What do you think is, could be better in this picture? It looks like they probably a forklift maybe damaged this product. So how do you handle damage in, in a storage area? How do you handle damage? I mean, when you, because things happen, let's be honest, you accidentally damage something. Maybe the fork hits the bag and, and you tore the bag of rice. Maybe it's flour and you tore a bag of flour. Maybe you dropped and dented some uh, a container of a, a carbonated soft drink and it splattered everywhere. How do you handle damage? See, having the damage isn't the problem. It's what you do next that could be the problem. And that means if you do nothing, that's the problem. Problem. So remember what we first started out with, identify, control, and eliminate. I've identified. You have a torn bag. I've controlled it. I've put tape on it. How are you going to eliminate it? And that's what you want to make sure you take the time and you do in your facility. And then here's some thermometers. 
there's a difference between a food safety thermometer and just a quality thermometer. They're both very, very important, but the food safety thermometer is the one that's really important. And here's what I mean. I, I like, I mentioned the carbonated soft drink. I, I, I like to have my carbonated soft drink cold. I like it cold. Um, but does it have to be stored in the refrigerator? Is it a food safety issue if it's, if it's stored on, on, on my shelf at home? Absolutely not. It's not a food safety issue. But now let's take milk. Is that an issue if I store it at room temperature all day long, all week long next to my carbonated soft drink? Probably don't want to do that. So you have to remember there's some things that are food safety and there's some things that are quality. Make sure you know the difference in your facility. Okay. So let's wrap up. Remember the make clause. I'm not, there's no test. There's no quiz. I promise. But if there was, that would be the only question I'd say, what was that word? I told you never, ever forget. It's the make clause. Make sure when you're going through your facility and you're talking to your employees, you're educating them with the word why. Remember the very first thing I showed you was that little thing of Reynolds wrap. And I bet some of you really and truly didn't know that you push the ends in on those and there's little roll holders. It means we don't always know as much as we think we know. So remember, educate, educate, educate. If you're not sure, use your resources. I always offer AIB as a phenomenal resource. Uh, AIB is always here to help the industry. Remember our mission statement. That's why I cover it at the beginning. It's important that you recognize us as a resource and then don't forget root cause analysis. I have two questions I'm gonna answer, ask before I turn it over to Steve and AFTO to ask me questions. These are questions that typically get asked on, on a web like this, and I want to answer them first. First one is, do we need rodent control devices at every 15 to 20 feet around our facility? Um, and I want to answer that because it's one of these things that everybody says, well, AIB says so. AIB says they got to be 20 to 40 feet because AIB says so. What AIB actually says in our consolidated standards, and remember, please download them on the website. What we actually say is based on your facility assessment. That's how you determine what the placement should be. So what we want is you evaluate the risk. That's what our standard says, based on your facility assessment. When we dictate that 20 to 40 foot rule is if, it, if there's no assessment that's been done, if you haven't done anything at all, then we say, you know, you might want to think about 20 to 40 feet on the interior traps. But please understand, we do not dictate the spacing of the traps. We want you to do it because you know the risk in your facility far better than we do. And the other question that we often get asked that I'm just going to throw it out there is, does our distribution center have to have insect light traps or bug lights? It is not a requirement in the AIB standard that you have insect light traps. What is a requirement? is if you do use them. So what our standard does say, it says if used, then the following rules have to apply. And it'll, it'll list some things that have, to be, uh, that have to be in place. For example, the glass light bulbs need to be protected. You need to make sure that they're not located so you're attracting insects over to where your product is directly stored. So we put a distance of 10 feet between the light trap and your product. And you never wanna be able to see them from outside. Because if you can see an insect light trap from outside the facility, guess what? So can the flying insects. Okay. So Steve, I turn it over to you and your team, but those are the questions that we frequently get asked. Sure. And don't forget everyone, if you have any questions for uh, Judy, please put them in the Q&A box or the chat window. We'll get them either place. We have several questions, Judy. People are ready to ask you uh, for lots of uh, assistance today. The first question is for a warehouse that stores only uh, stores and distributes sealed canned goods, is pest control important and uh, how so? That's a great question. So yes, even if you're storing only canned goods, pest control is still always important. So here's a good, here's a good scenario this time of year. Whenever we have a temperature change, when it goes from really hot to really cold or really cold to really hot, rodents have one thing that they want to do and they want to get to the most comfortable environment for them. So if it's really, really cold, they're going to try and get inside of a building. If it's really, really hot, they're going to try and get inside of a building. So even though you don't have what you consider exposed food, you still have harborage. And, and I always think of pest control. When I think about pest management, I think of a triangle. And there's three things on the triangle. There's harborage, food, and water. 
And, and, and if you have those things on the triangle, you should always consider a good pest control program. And you always have that in your facility with Harbridge. So you may not have the most aggressive that a, a facility that, you know, based on your location, I don't know where you're located. You might have, a, you know, there might be a city dump right next to you, which has a lot of trash that's going to always attract a lot of pests. So you may have a lot of pest pressures on the outside as well. So I don't know what your exterior grounds are, but you may have a lot of pest pressures. So you want to make sure you have a truly a, a good integrated pest management program inside your facility. Okay. It looks like the next question we have is, how about the GMP among employees within a storage and distribution facilities as opposed to manufacturing facilities? Uh, PPE use and control, what do they absolutely need to follow to prevent contamination? That's a great question. So, you know, one one real big difference between a stored warehouse and in a manufacturing plant, really the big difference comes with hair nets. And that's where we notice the most. If you're working in a food manufacturing plant, you're putting on a hair net before you ever step foot in the plant. Whereas if you're in a, in a warehouse, a distribution center, you're not putting on that hair net. So that's really the biggest difference that we see when we when we compare manufacturing to warehousing. Other than that, I'm, I mean it when I tell you the, the G GMPs are really very, very specific in the sense that it answers the May clause. So you're still not going to be eating, drinking, smoking in the warehouse. When you mention PPE, though, PPE is personal protective equipment. And, and that's a little bit different than food safety. So PPE, for example, might be a pair of safety glasses. So you put on safety glasses to protect the employee, not necessarily to protect the product. So when you talk about PPE, that tells me it's, you know, it's not specific to food safety. And really, th that's something that you should set your own PPE requirements based on your safety, your occupational safety performance. So that's something I'm not an OSHA expert and don't have that skill. So I, I shy away from answering the question on the PPE. Okay, our next question is, is there any written guidance to decide what kind of floor, such as epoxy, methyl, oh boy, methyl crylate, et cetera, that I need for certain industries? Is there any good guidance out there for that? There actually is. And I will tell you, there's a wonderful book that I, I would strongly recommend it to anybody that's manufacturing, uh, or sorry, not manufacturing, that's building uh, a, a, a facility, whether you're building a greenfield site or whether you're buying a new site and you're doing one over, there's a wonderful book out there. It's called the Thomas Eimholt book. Uh, you don't have to write it down again, shoot me an email and I'll send it to you. But here's what AIB has that I, and I really mean this, we have the best resources in the industry. And, and that includes we have great contacts with floor experts. I'm not an expert on floors. I absolutely would never tell you, oh, yeah, call me. I can answer the question. No nope, wrong answer. But what I will tell you is I have great floor experts that I can call and put you in contact with. So before you go and make such a huge investment in your facility, phone calls are free. And I would encourage you to pick up the phone, call me, and let me put you in touch with the person that really is a floor expert. But there is a great book out there. And, and I I think it's for anybody that's doing any kind of maintenance or manufacturing or and I mean manufacturing by the building type by by you know using that word in, in the building sense uh, I would strongly encourage the Thomas Eimholt book. Let's see our next question is is it okay to store product in uh, polypropylene bags or sacks placed on the floor with just a slip sheet in between or does it need to be stored off the ground on a pallet? Another great question. So it really depends on, on the application, on where you're going to use it. But if you're keeping clean slip sheets on the floor, that is your, that's your protective barrier. That's protecting you from that debris on the floor. So in most cases, and there might be some few instances where it wouldn't be okay, in most cases, that's absolutely an acceptable practice. Are there any new regulations since the pandemic began? So there's not new regulations since the pandemic began, but there's a lot of activity since the pandemic began. And, and, and you know, and AIB can help you with this also. We have, we have a standard that will help you, the Pandemic Prepared Certification Standard. So we can absolutely help you with that as well. Remember, we're a great resource. And so it's a standard full of guidance and best practices, and it is absolutely based on regulation, and it's based on CDC guidelines. It's really, AFTO was a great partner with us, and they helped us review it and gave us their critique. Um, so that's something, again, if you want to reach out to AIB, we'll be happy to help you with that. 
Um, we have a question. Uh, what about overhead lights? And I don't have additional information. So do you want to take a stab at what? I will take a stab. I bet the question is, do my overhead lights need to be protected from breakage? I bet that's probably the question. So if you have glass overhead lights in an area where there's exposed food products, let's say, for example, you have produce underneath. So you have, you know, heads of lettuce and carrots. I mean, there's exposed produce, bags of potatoes and things like that. Then those glass light bulbs directly above that produce absolutely have to be protected from breakage. So they either have to be shatter resistant lights or you have to put a protective coating or a cover, some type of protective barrier. So if that glass light bulb were to break, it's not going to contaminate the product below. But now let's take the gentleman or the lady that wrote in and said, my warehouse is only cans. I only have cans. Does he or she also need to have protect lighting. They do not have to have glass with shatter resistant lights. However, here's the big but, they have to control their lights. So they can do one of two things. They can do an inventory where they have a glass and brittle plastic program that manages the condition of the lights or they can put shatter resistant lights in place. And you know what I would encourage you to do? Put shatter resistant lights in place. It's easier to manage than managing a glass inventory. Boy, we have lots of questions today, Judy. Um, but I just want to remind everyone, if you have any more questions, please go ahead and put those in the QA window. But our next question is, if we use an external license company for pest monitoring, what is the recommendation for the frequency of their coming to the facility uh, per month? How many times per month would you suggest? Yeah, and I, I can't make that suggestion without knowing anything about your facility. But let me give you some some the rule of average, if, if I may. Most companies will hire a service to come once a week. Um, and then if not once a week, then every two weeks. I, I know very few companies that go beyond that. Um, most companies though, you know, the, the food distribution centers are usually once a week or every two weeks. Uh, but now if you want to go once a month, you certainly can. I mean, you certainly can do that. But, you know, you might want to also train somebody internally to check your rodent control devices, for example. But I, that's a question. I, there's no way I can answer that without knowing anything about your facility. If you're a high risk facility, what I mean by that is if you're storing a lot of grain based products, which are very insect susceptible, boy, Boy, I don't want to see you going too far. But if you're that facility that's all canned goods, you know, maybe you could get away with going once a month. And then maybe somebody checks the traps, uh, you know, internally. I mean, there's different variations. So again, great question, but sadly, I don't have a solid answer for you. Our next question is, is very interesting. We are transitioning to a new warehouse. What are things that we need to consider on moving our materials from one site to another? And what are the factors that we need to inspect before moving into the new warehouse? Another great question. Wow, these are great questions. What a, we got a lively team today on a Friday afternoon. I thank everybody, all the attendees. Thank you for these great questions. If I were moving into a new facility, the first thing I would ask myself is, do I have anything that is temperature sensitive? Because I don't want to break the cold chain. And what I mean by that is if I have something that has to be maintained at a, a specific temperature, I want to make sure that I do not lose control of that temperature when I move from point A to point B. So that would be the first thing that I would be worried about is my cold chain. How is my cold chain going to be managed? Then I would make sure that I have enough space in my new facility because let's be honest, they always look really, really big when they're empty. But when you start bringing in product, boy, you better figure out where this product's going to be slotted before you start bringing it over there. Otherwise, you'll lose inventory. You'll truly lose inventory. Um, again, if I, if I may, Stephen, I hate to keep recommending people back to AIB, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, we can actually help you with blueprints. We can help you with uh, plan layouts. We can do that all before you make this move. But short answer for the time we have, I would absolutely focus on my cold chain. Great. We have three more questions out there, Judy. Uh, the next question is how often uh, ingredient and raw materials are inspected in the warehouse? Uh, and then along with that, is the temperature and humidity control for ambient storage required? So the, the first question is about the, the uh, ingredients in a warehouse. So what, if you're talking about anything that's grain based, it is probably what I'm, my guess is you're thinking when you think ingredients, you're thinking spices, things like that. Those are insect susceptible. 
meaning if you don't manage them, you're going to have stored product insects and you'll quickly infest your whole facility with insects like they're called cigarette beetles, Indian meal moths, flower beetles, and you will truly infest your whole facility. So what we encourage you to do is at least once a month, you inspect that raw material. You truly inspect it. It doesn't mean you have to restack every bag, but it means you do want to look at it. And that's why it's important that when you bring in product that you're putting dates on it so you know when that product was received. The other question about temperature control, it really depends on the product. It absolutely depends on your product. If you're storing chocolates, for example, it's going to be a lot different than if I'm storing, even if I store something that's wrapped with shrink wrap, because, you know, if, I, if it's warm and it's wrapped with shrink wrap, I might get condensation developing on the inside. So it really depends on your product. I can't answer that question. Okay. Our, our next question is, uh, and our last question for the day, um, what about a window near the packaging area? As it's not over the product, is there any guidance for risk assessment on a window like that? Yeah, you answered the question with risk assessment. And that's a, um, that's a, a very educated person that asked that question just because they use the language of the industry, the food safety language, and that's risk assessment. So do a risk assessment because, you know, if you do have, you do want to control the glass. So you put it on your glass inventory. You absolutely want to put it on your glass inventory. But whether you protect it or not really depends on the risk. If it's far enough away from the product and you say it's very unlikely that even somebody who's sweeping the floor is going to hit it with a broom or forklift's going to bump it. If you really have, you know, deduced that there's no risk there, then, you know, put it on your glass inventory, then say you're going to inspect it once a month, once every quarter, something like that. If you see it as a greater risk, then protect it. Anytime that I have glass, you know, if I were, a, a, if I were yourself in your facility, I would absolutely protect that. And there's some good products out there now that are, there are the coatings that you can put, they're very inexpensive, that you can actually put over glass windows like that, that will provide you some, some protection. We ended up with two more questions, Judy. Do you have just another two minutes you or bet. so? You bet, sure. How does food storage mixed with non-food storage work? Do you have to keep food separate from non-food, such as not storing non-food product on racking above food products, even though they are both in primary and secondary packaging? Uh, any advice? So, you know, this it's a, that's a common question and a lot of facilities will have non-food stored adjacent to food products. So let's say maybe I have white ingredient containers, white containers, brute containers. Everybody recognizes what a big plastic trash container looks like. Now, do I want to store it next to food product? Depends. And I know you're going, oh, here she goes with the depends, right? It does depend. And I'll tell you why. I was in a facility once a long time ago and they had what I thought was no big deal. They had bags of flour stored next to tires that go on forklifts. You guys think that's a big deal? I mean, I looked at it, didn't think anything about it until I went through the facility and they said, Judy, we're surprised that you didn't say anything about the tires and the forklift. And this was early in my career. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, we, we're gonna let you in on a little secret. We've been having complaints. We're actually restructuring the warehouse because the odor from the rubber tires has been absorbing into the flour. Never did I think of that. I was early in my career. I never forgot it. It's kind of like the Reynolds wrap. Once you learn it, you never forget it. I never forgot that. So I'd be very cautious about storing things next to food products unless you really understand what the risk is on what you're storing adjacent to one another. Well, we had one more question and it is, do we need a hand washing station in a warehouse where we do not touch the product? You absolutely need a hand wash station in the warehouse, whether you have it in the restroom uh, or whether you have it somewhere else and, and having it in the restroom is great. But remember, you might not touch the product, but you know, there has to be, your employees have to wash their hands. So again, it could be in the restroom, but you, you know, remember that pile of trash that I had left on the floor? How do you want somebody, they just swept it, now they're gonna pick it up. That, that you, you, you want them not to clean their hands. So absolutely, you gotta make sure hand washing is accessible. This is still a food, food uh, distribution environment. Well, Judy, we want to thank you for your wonderful presentation today. I think the Q&A uh, tells us how much the participants were enjoying the opportunity to converse with you and learn more. Uh, and also Mark and Amy, who helped prepare this webinar uh, for today. I uh, would like to invite everyone to join us again on April 2nd, when we talk about the manufacturing of beverages. And then once again on April 12th, when we talk about packaging manufacturers. So please join us for both of those series. And once again, if you did happen to miss our webinar from two weeks ago, that is available 
available on YouTube and you'll actually get a link to this series uh, uh, in the next few days so that you can share it with your colleagues. Once again, thank you, Judy, for a wonderful presentation on uh, food distribution and storage and have a wonderful weekend, everyone.